And welcome to the Agami Next uh, podcast. Pontus Lindvall, EBIT plus 55%, group revenue plus 31%, and active customers plus 46%. How happy is Pontus Lindvall on a scale of 1 to 10 today? Yeah, I'm I'm very happy. I'm satisfied with the quarter and the and the result in general and and uh, actually it's I'm really glad to see that finally we get some uh, payoff for the for the hard work that we have done over the past 3 years or so. Yeah, and um, it's interesting you start on on that note because it feels a little bit like the last couple of years uh, the uh, the agri industry has had a tough time in in many areas, uh, especially the the Nordic focused uh, operators. Um, but recently, now especially this year, um, it feels like the tides are turning a little bit. Is there anything you can attribute that to that the industry is now doing better? I don't know. It it seems that this industry swings back and forth, and we've been on a negative uh, on the negative side for a while. Um, I think one thing that has helped uh, recently is the tragic fact, I would say, that COVID happened and it turned out that this industry again was kind of resilient towards a hard time compared to many other industries. And that may have helped a bit mm. uh, to change the view on the industry. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's something I spoke to with, uh, with a friend of mine a while ago who, who, who mentioned the fact that, you know, the agame industry has previously been resilient uh, to downturns in the economy. Uh, you, 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 you always made the argument that the agame industry is recession proof. But now investors seem to also look for industries that are pandemic proof. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. so you have the both of them, right? It's uh, like what, uh, what the industries are pandemic proof and what the industries are recession proof. And the agame industry is both. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and we didn't know uh, that uh, six months ago, we didn't hardly know that there were any pandemics uh, uh, mm. around and that that was a threat to certain industries. But now we know for sure. And I, I thought about it this morning. I mean, it's, it's, it's a borderline question. We are on the online side of the business and we are uh, doing quite well. And our, you know, colleagues and friends on the land based side, they struggle a lot. And some of them are really in, 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 in bad shape. And how, how could they know six months ago? So it's, uh, it's, it's a really tough situation for them. And we have to judge ourselves being lucky by being in our position. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Uh, I guess another. Would you say as well as another uh, reason why the industry is now doing better again is uh, it seems that kind of before the uh, uh, locally regulated markets became a thing, uh, especially in, in, in Northern uh, Europe, um, the, uh, some operators uh, didn't have that good geographical spread, for example. And uh, when the regulation in Sweden happened and, and um, uh, other Northern European uh, countries uh, that seem to have affected them the, the bottom line in, in a lot of organizations and uh, would you say that uh, these last couple of years like the hard work that we have done uh, kind of to increase the um, the geographical spread and being able to deal with the local regulated markets and uh, all the uh, additional due diligence that it brings is that also a key to why the um, numbers are now looking much better it, it's a complex question to answer because you know on the one hand you can say that when regulation when local regulation comes uh, to market it comes with a tax burden and also compliance burden for uh, to be able to follow regulations and you need to take on more staff and that mm -hmm. that obviously you know calls for uh, a higher level of market share in order to be able to to, to sustain profits uh, etc. On the other hand, looking at the history, you don't want to be too big in any single market because if if the local regulation hits you really hard, <laughs> then it's kind of you know bring, taking the company down anyway. So 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 from that regard, it's better to be spread out. And and if you have a, a real bad hit in a market, it doesn't really affect the figures that hard because you have so uh, so diversified. Uh, revenue stream so mm. i i think for us it's you know 
it, it hasn't been a strategic move to have all the, those markets. It, it's rather that we have, for sure, we have been interested in many markets and we have started to, to work in many markets and, and we where we find markets that work well then we continue and invest more and we grow and when we find markets that doesn't work at all then we leave and but but now it has turned out that we are quite happy to have a broad scale of of markets yeah yeah because um th that begs the question as well looking at like europe versus rest of the world um the fact that uh, the fact that uh, like operators like Betson are, are now looking at emerging markets like Colombia now recently with uh, your acquisition of Colbet, um, and uh, and now you're pushing into the US and 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 these other things. Um, I mean, looking at the regulated market in Europe, some you know upcoming regulation in in uh, in Germany, the continued stricter climate in the UK, uh, other. Uh, markets following suit in the in in Europe like yeah how do you see the future of uh, the European markets uh, I think the general uh, view within the industry on the European market is that some markets now tend to become overregulated and that will hurt the markets it will kind of actively push players outside of the regulation and into offshore operations and uh, I believe this is not done by purpose from the regulators rather they will have some kind of learning curve and uh, sooner or later they will find out that you, you can't put too much restrictions on the offering to the client or put too much efforts on the client because then they will find other alternatives but for the time being these regulated markets in Europe looks a little bit challenging due to overregulation, and I think that is uh, a reason for uh, looking elsewhere with new establishments in, in, like you said, the US and South America and, and other places. Yeah, uh, and it's an interesting point you're making with the uh, with the overregulation in in Europe that uh, we've seen obviously in, in some markets, um, because I remember a couple of years ago when. Uh, you know, Sweden was about to be regulated, and uh, the major operators were looking forward to the uh, regulator uh, to the regulation. You know, now we'll have market stability. Uh, you know, consolidation of uh, uh, of the operation uh, operators there, uh, more serious players like channelization rates and all the things. Um, but now, looking at the situation we are in now, um, would you say that? Uh, you were, would you say that Betson are still uh, kind of, um, would you still push for more uh, regulated markets, uh, locally regulated markets? Uh, is that something you, you still look uh, as a positive thing for the future of the industry? I, I think uh, whether they become regulated or not, uh, it's not in our control. We just have to live with it. I think yeah. uh, we will see regulation uh coming in in more markets and uh, looking from figures that has been provided to us from external sources we do think that uh, locally regulated markets will not grow as fast in the coming five years as they did in the past five years so that's okay. one thing to take into consideration uh, in regards of the swedish market mm. uh, when we look at the regulation here uh, black and white on paper, I think it's a good regulation. Actually, it allows for most products. Uh, it's it's a decent tax rev, uh, tax level. Uh, it's rather the implementation and the handling of the market that has been a little bit uh, different from what we expected. Mm. Uh, the authority has been, you know, uh, first of all, you have to say that the regulations is not one hundred percent crystal clear. It's 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 a frame regulatory regulatory framework and the interpretation of that has been a little bit different from uh, by the operators compared to, to the regulator and that has led to some uh, fines and some uh, misunderstandings and, and and that's definitely not on purpose by the operators so so mm. uh, the, the Swedish regulation we find quite nice the regulation as such but we are a little bit surprised by the hard interpretation by the authority yeah and uh, i mean this is hot potato right now obviously and and uh, in sweden right now I, I know that there are some rumors that um, uh, there might be legal action uh, against the states basically challenging um, 
uh, challenging uh, a lot of these uh, decisions with these like you know over the top fines for um, uh, and, and and also uh, against the restrictions that they implemented now in the in the summer um, that seems to have been kind of against what the uh, uh, that that seems to have been based on false information. Um, is that something that Betson stands behind taking legal action, or how do you view how do you view it that side? Um, we look at the cases as such, and, and if we think mm. we have been uh, treated in, in the wrong way, then we will overrule mm. the decisions and, and, and hope to get them uh, correctly judged. That is as far as we will go uh, yeah. at, at this point of time. Yeah, fair enough. And um, then on that note as well, with the, uh, with the restrictions uh, that have been implemented now in the, in the summer, the additional uh, restrictions to, to protect the players, um, do, do you think that there is a chance that these will become permanent? Uh, of course, there is a, a risk for that. Uh, it has been stated that it, it should not. So uh, if I would have to guess or put a bet on it, I would say that they will not be permanent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's the, that's the big question, all right? And like you were saying, the, the, the government has been clear that these are temporary uh, restrictions. But uh, uh, I know as well that uh, there, there are some organizations that are preparing their budgets in that, uh, in that scenario should... Uh, should they be uh, prolonged, basically? Um, but is 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 that something you you guys are kind of uh, lobbying against? Like, are you trying to um, are you trying to prevent that from happening in in uh, in, in some way, or are you working towards uh, those restrictions being lifted? Um, I, I, I think we do that through the the, the organization of Boos, uh, especially Boos, and yep. potentially also Spear. Um, mm because the regulation the limitations as such was put into only a fraction of the market so it's a little bit tilted mm. and uh, for that reason we of course want to to get them removed and, and we didn't think they were necessary in the first place yeah there was oh, of no course and, yeah of course and it, it's it was uh, they were based on a uh, on a false premise, which was the fact that uh, the uh, casino uh, re revenue would w were increasing in Sweden, which it turned out it was uh, not. And uh, yeah. as you were mentioning, um, uh, both uh, BRS is obviously the the Swedish industry organization, uh, which is represented by Betson and many other uh, uh, operators and, and uh, gaming operators in, in Sweden uh, to basically uh, give the industry a, a voice uh, specifically for these type of, of uh, issues. Um, yeah. yeah, but I, yeah. I, I think the, the whole uh, the whole thing behind those regulations were not based on facts. They, they were based on some kind of uh, <laughs> guess. And uh, I actually checked our figures yesterday, the, the figures that we published uh, this morning today, mm. and uh, the revenue per active user in the database is like more than 10% lower this quarter than the same quarter last year. And that shows that the spending per capita is actually going downwards, not upwards, as, as the minister indicated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and that is the, then the basis of this um, uh, potential uh, legal action that will be taken against the state, which is uh, the fact that it was based on a completely false premise, um, mm. uh, which, uh, which then obviously has to have some form of repercussion. But uh, we'll, we'll wait and see uh, what, uh, what is going to happen on that side. Um, I want to uh, ask you a little bit, uh, Pontus, on the German side of things now. Uh, Germany uh, also is uh, becoming an, an, um, a regulated market, uh, um, a locally regulated market. And in, but in the meantime, uh, they are now implementing uh, this, um, uh, how would you say, like the uh, temporary re regulatory framework. Um, and it was announced in, in, a, in a very short amount of time that you had to kind of uh, do uh, like a, a massive amount of... Uh, um, different points to protect on the players again and to follow this like uh, this temporary regulation. Um, how, how do you guys see uh, uh, the interim regulation is called? Like how, how do you see this interim regulation in Germany and uh, uh, do, you, do you have enough time to uh, be compliant to when it comes into effect? Which is in like in about a month time I think. 
Uh, it, it actually came into effect on the 15th of October, so that's... Uh, oh, it's already in effect, okay. It, it's in effect, and it was announced on the 30th of September, yeah. which gave us uh, around two weeks to, to make mm. the changes. And uh, the, the problem is that the, the sites that we operate, and, and those gaming sites, it's, it's not like a thin homepage with a couple of uh, uh, graphical elements. These are more or less banking systems that cater mm. for a lot of transactions and money so so it's it's very unfortunate that we were forced mm. into you know making quite dramatic changes to those systems in 14 days because when we do that it comes with the risk for for, for the customer at the end of the day worst mm. case now we have managed to to change the majority of the requirements uh, and we did that on time but the, we had to drop everything that we were working on in terms of new development and focus the company totally on this in order to make that happen so uh, the, the, on the question what i think about the german temporary regulations I, I don't like the way they were implemented because it was very hard for us to 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 do that in that short time frame in the long term i think we will come out well at the other end of the tunnel so to say when the the market is finally being regulated, which is in July next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will see what happens then. There are further limitations that will have to be implemented uh, until we come there. Yeah. And I mean, this short amount of time to make these massive changes. I mean, you, you are a solid big organization with a lot of resources uh, who can quickly, uh, you know, put your resources to make these changes. But if you are a smaller or medium operator, how would you ever be able to implement these changes in, in time? It's impossible, right? Yes, it's it's very hard. And uh, I, I think you just uh, lean back and give up virtually and leave the market. And yeah. that's, you know, when it becomes too com complicated, then the the channelization, the, 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 the ratio of customers that are uh, still inside the regulated environment will go down and that's very unfortunate uh, for for the for the state that they get less uh, tax income but even more so for the client itself that end up somewhere you know outside in a, in a not controlled environment yeah yeah of course uh, before we start looking at uh, kind of more positive movements in the uh, in the market i just want to do a quick stop in the uk as well because i saw that you um uh, released a press release the other day uh, announcing that you will consolidate your i think it's you had something like eight brands operating in 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 the uk market previously and you're consolidating that to one brand now uh, risk um yeah. uk uk market obviously uh, also facing very tough uh, uh, regulation and um, uh, it's becoming more difficult to operate in that market how, how do you see uh, your future in that market and why did you choose to consolidate the brands into only one what is the upside with that yeah uh, it's, it's a good question actually you said eight brands uh, we stated nine brands but when nine. we really calculated it, it turned out it was ten brands <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so uh, and, and that's all we, we have uh, around 3% of our revenues. We had 3% of our revenues from the UK, which is not uh, yeah. really big. And uh, it, it just turned out that we had so many brands and we had three different platforms. And that's uh, that's not a result of a strategic decision. It's rather a result of acquisitions and, and, and things that has been going on that we have added on. And, and this kind of uh, operational structure that we had took a lot of uh resources internally to 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 work on three different platforms and keep them compliant and, and all, all the other work that had to be done with the 10 brands so it, it that's not the optimal structure if you want to become uh, mm. profitable um, so looking at that and the competitive situation in the uk of course we could be compliant with 10 brands but you know the, the bottom line would not be very happy about that so <laughs> we see a lot of other uh, opportunities elsewhere in the world and we decided to let's stay there with one brand the uk market is is very important and huge gaming market in europe we want to remain there and and we'll see how the market turns out in the future but we don't want to keep on operating so many brands on that high cost level it's it's just not sensible
Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, other major operators have even chosen to exit the market completely, like uh, Come On Group, we being one of yeah. them, for example. Like, uh, uh, was that ever on the uh, like on the discussion for you guys? Like, uh, you you still continue to push one brand, but how do you see? Yeah, of course, we discussed if we should withdraw totally, but but uh, as I said, it, it's a large market uh, mm. in general, not not for Betson, and you never know what's what's happening mm. in the future. Uh, we know that you know the trends swing back and forth, and now the it's it's at one end of the spectra. It it may turn back in the future, and then we want to be there uh, in the market. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, just taking a, a step back uh, now, Pontus, uh, to the quarterly report uh, itself that was uh, released today. Like uh, we, we, I started this podcast uh, saying, obviously you you released the podcast with uh, amazing numbers. Uh, you know, you're trending uh, towards an all-time high in terms of revenue uh, for 2020, uh, and still the share price, even though it's jumped today at the release of the report, it's still um, lower than it, what it was uh, two years ago, for example, uh, when you had your previous uh, all-time high. W would you say that the, the share price is undervalued at the moment? Uh, not the share price as such. We, we can just comment on the fact that uh, this industry as a whole has been revalued by investors in a way and, and and some institutional investors mainly in the nordics has chosen to, to leave this industry for esg matters and that has of course had an impact on, on the valuation um, i think when you look at our numbers uh, that we presented today it, it shows we, we're quite a big company uh, we have quite a strong growth we're a growth company it's not many companies on the on on the main top part of of the Nasdaq the list that shows that kind of growth, uh, and we have a solid profitability, and we give dividends. Uh, so we should be a nice investment alternative. But some some institutional capital has chosen to to leave, and now we see the influx of new other institutional investors with a different uh, yeah. scope and and different needs. So. Uh, I, I think that is the reason for the share price being uh, not as high as it was, uh, especially not uh, if you compare it to 2015, where this whole industry had some kind of peak in valuations. But as a company, mm. we are in a far better position today. Yeah. Uh, company is much more uh, technical advanced, we're bigger, the, the organization yeah. is better. So. So uh, that's where we stand as a company, and and uh, yeah, maybe we get the value out of that someday. Yeah, exactly. And the industry is more mature as well. I would say uh, too. You know, the the outlook uh, for the industry looks, uh, I think, uh, uh, much better now than than it has done uh, before. And also leading back to this point that uh, you know, looking at uh, like institutional investors are now looking at you know which which uh, industries are, are pandemic proof uh, as well as uh, as well as recession proof. And the industry has a lot uh, of good things going for it. You man you mentioned uh, ESG, so. I have I have a very basic understanding of uh, of what that means because it has uh, uh, something to do with the kind of uh, corporate responsibility um, uh, program and things like that. Like, um, so it's a perception issue of the industry. I would uh, I would imagine why the ESG uh, why this is working against the industry. Is there is there a way for us as an industry, as an agame industry, to turn this perception around that sometimes uh, we have against us, the, you know, that it's just the media perspective that you only see one side of? Yes, and I think it's an important task that, that we work mm. with that and try to explain more. Uh, mm. Then again, there will be some investors that will not be open to invest in gaming companies. And I have full respect for that it's everyone's choice where to invest but but if, if they if they walk away from gaming companies they should do it for the right reasons and this is where we had to educate uh, the uh, this community because this what we do we work with entertainment it's it's betting it's casino we have a lot of clients they spend most of them spend small amounts of money to entertain themselves and it's it's uh, 
gambling as such is accepted by the society in general everywhere and yeah. uh, it's, it's also being conducted by the states itself through the state owned monopolies so so this is an uh, a business which is well accepted then it, it has a, an issue and that is that some players becomes uh, problematic players and it's a very little uh, share of all the players that end up there and this is of course unfortunate and it's nothing that we benefit from as an industry we want to have our customers long term and to be long term good and happy customers so we have the same interest in, as everybody else to try to prevent this and we have become a lot better um, over the years and in, in the presentation I had this morning, I said that we have conducted like, was it like 92,000 contacts with people for responsible mm. gaming purpose during the quarter. That, that's quite a lot. And I've been in this industry for such a long time and we started to work with this more than 15 years ago, but we have come a long way and, and we have more to learn and we will continue to work hard within this area. But it's important for us that we can explain to the investors that we this is nothing that we want to hide we want to discuss this there yeah. is a, it is a problem for a very little minority of our customers and we work every day to try to limit that risk and and if they just understood this i think that they would have a little bit more positive view on the industry yeah i, I completely agree with that Pontus. i i think that that is um that is where the industry needs to become better is to educate and uh, reach out with this information because uh, there are some like incredibly uh, technological advancements that we as an industry uh, are leading when it comes to uh, player protection and uh, KYC um, uh, uh, procedures and, and so forth to be able to know every single uh, customer uh, what their what their habits are, what they can afford to spend, and so forth. And the, the industry is really innovative in that in that regard, and doing a really really good work that can then spill over to other industries uh, uh, as well. So there, there's, I think that there's a lot of other tech industries that can learn from uh, from gaming in the innovation that is happening in in this uh, space at the moment. And the point is that, like you were saying, Pontus, the the responsible organizations, uh, you know, the, the the ones that like yourself who are uh, you know, fully compliant um, in the local regulated markets, uh, who are pursuing doing the doing the right thing, uh, absolutely have the right intention to uh, uh, offer this as an entertainment uh, um, and uh, as a form of entertainment, rather than uh, what the perception can be sometimes when you only look at the media report, which is uh, just uh, negativity. I mean, we we've been it, I've been in industry for a long time as well, Pontus, and we've gone through the. The poker boom that happened in like the early 2000s i mean then every man and his dog were playing poker you know and and um, clearly that was uh, that was accepted in society back then uh, 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 because it was so much more widespread you know and um, if it can be accepted then i think that uh, the industry has a chance to uh, improve the perception again yeah I'm sure it has, and we will work on that. And it's it's in the interest of all organizations that is related to this mm. industry. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so I have a question from a friend of mine, actually, um, who who has been in contact with you before. Thomas Wilbs is his uh, uh, name. Um, and he's asking, uh, it's quite an interesting question, I thought, uh, based on the quarterly report. Uh, he's asking, uh, what would the top line be? If you Corona neutralized the numbers in the in the uh, for this year, how big of an effect has Corona has on the business, positive or negative? Uh, yeah, if definitely if Corona didn't happen, we would be on a lower revenue for the third quarter. That's at least my guess. Uh, this industry of, of of online game gaming got a nice push uh, by the unfortunate. Corona pandemic and the lockdown, where some uh, location, gaming locations had to be shut down, etc. And naturally, some of the players that used to, to play uh, offline were pushed to the online uh, environment. And what we see now, when some of the offline uh, uh, gaming sites has opened up again, it seems that some of the players decided to stay 
online. Maybe they find found a new product that, that they like a lot. So uh, uh, I, I think we established a, a new level, so to say, uh, mm. in the past six months. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see um, uh, if we look at the market share between online and offline. I think online uh, online gambling right now is accounting for something like twenty three percent of the total gambling uh, market versus uh, versus in person. And it will be interesting now with the digitization of the industry uh, that is uh, that is taking place right now. The digitization of the world. Uh, how much uh, market share is online going to take from land based? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's that's really interesting and uh, we, we just have to wait and see but but i'm sure that we uh, not only for internet gaming but for many industries i'm sure that this uh, has kind of you know uh, pushed further accelerated the digitalization of many businesses mm, that's for sure so uh, a last topic of the, uh, today pontus uh, if you don't mind uh, i just want to go over to the us uh, again which is on everyone's mind right now um Obviously, you are uh, you, you have a license in Colorado. And you are pushing your propriety sports book there. Uh, you mentioned in your investor call today that you don't expect uh, Betson to do a massive marketing push into uh, into the U.S. market, so it shouldn't affect the EBIT uh, for next year uh, uh, too much. Um, looking at U.S. as a market, which is like the most difficult market to penetrate in the world, the most expensive market to penetrate and so forth. How does those two statements go together? How will you capitalize on the US market without uh, without a big marketing push behind it? Yeah, that's a big secret that we have. <laughs> that's a big no, secret. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, we haven't received any license in Colorado yet. We're in the process oh. of, uh, okay, sorry. of application, but, but mm. we're... Uh, on the move at least uh, as you said it's a it's a big market and it's expensive to to go in there uh, betson has chosen to to have to mainly have a business to business route into that market which means that we will supply other organizations with our technology and possibly mm-hmm. operational skills and and uh, and these other organizations will uh, build their brands and 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 build up their market presence there and then you can ask and why do we then open up business to consumer in colorado which is not the biggest state in the us and that is for us to 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 be relevant to to other operators we believe that we must have some kind of shop window where people can see and test our products and we have a great uh, strong belief in our product when it's adopted for the US market. So, so we believe that that will be a nice uh, way of showing off uh, what we have to offer to other operators. Mm-hmm. And, and that is all the, also the reason for my comment on the, on the quarterly report this morning that we are not really there to conquer the market with our own uh, cash box. We are there to present ourselves in Col- Colorado and build up mm-hmm. and yes we will market and yes we will build a nice operation there but we will not you know over invest and kind of uh, try to take the whole US market and, and that is why I wanted to convey the information that we will not you know have a massive negative impact yeah. on the EBIT by going into the US. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting topic in general, and it's uh, it's it's worth its own podcast, I think, of a, of another hour for for that market. But um, just as a final point on that, uh, just to just to solidify how big confidence the share the uh, the investors have in that market right now. Um, so William Hill, where were recently uh, acquired by uh, Caesars Entertainment uh, at a valuation of two point nine billion. Uh, pound and their la- latest quarterly report they had an earnings uh, of uh, something like 555 million uh, pound in, in revenue at the same time uh, DraftKings in the US uh, had revenues in the last quarter of 130 million US dollars and uh, uh, valued on the stock market at 16 billion um, and this is in a market that has uh, no track record uh, it's completely uh, anyone's guess uh, what's going to happen, but that's how massive, massively the um, investors believe in that market. Uh, and uh, you know, so do you feel that as well? Like, uh, like, uh, do, do you agree with uh, with that type of 
um, like belief uh, in the US market and and uh, what's your thoughts on the future like will it be so important that market that you have to capitalize now or will you be able to penetrate later um i i think no market is 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 closed or or static so there will always happen things you can you you can enter that market at a later stage you don't need to be first mm. there uh we believe our way of entering is is a smart way of doing it without doing you know trial and error with a, a lot of money uh, there are investigations uh, about market size and estimates and, and they all show that the us will be a big market in the future so so mm. in, in that way you can say that the, the market is right that values uh, the operators over there to, to a high premium but then again it's uh, about mm. succeeding as well and and there are several competitors and and let, let's see who will uh, who will be strong. There are a couple of them who are strong today, but I, I don't think that picture is static either. There will be competition and, and we will see other strong players showing up as well. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that's a good way of, of ending today, I think. So Betson has taken the, um, the Apple approach uh, with the US market. You don't have to be first, but as long as you do it right. Uh, exactly. I, think that's, I think that's a good way to, uh, to end today. Uh, Pontus, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on today. I mean, again, congratulations to the, the quarterly report. It uh, makes me really happy to see as well. With uh, uh, I have my own uh, old uh, bets on roots as well. So um, been uh, been around and been following you guys for a long time. So uh, always a pleasure to, to talk to you. And um, do you have any final words that you'd like to mention? No, thanks for uh, for discussing. It's uh... It's interesting, and uh, as you said, let's have a separate topic on the US at, uh, yeah. one day. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I would love to. Pontus, in the meantime, I wish you a good weekend and uh, a good day, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. See you. Bye bye. Bye.